Well, thank you very much. I'm absolutely terrified. That's the first thing I have to say because Caroline told me this was a perk of the job. And I teach at third level where lectures would be considered purgatory rather than perks, uh, where it's something that people have to get through to try and get to the other end. So it's really exciting for an academic to be invited to come and talk to Google people because you are the unknowable, uh, the sort of, um, uh, the group of people that you know we all hear about, uh, the millennials, etc. But we know very little about you. Uh, so I hope that I'm going to learn something from you guys today. Um, Caroline told me that the theme Google has set this year is fostering connection. So what I've tried to do is prepare a talk, and I decided that I wouldn't do the whole oh, PowerPoint thing. That I would actually try and use some props. So I'm going to be channeling Mary Poppins. And I don't have Mary Poppins' carpet bag, but I borrowed my son's disgusting rucksack, which I realized was <laughs> damp because it was down at Electric Picnic, so my props might be getting a little bit uh, shabby inside. So I thought in, I would try to use a few props to get you thinking about the sociological meaning of connection. And really, connection is at the core of what it is to be a human. And that's what sociologists look at. It's, we look at how people are, how they experience the world in terms of their connectedness with, the, with others. And that's really important because to connect with others takes you out of the privatized self. And it creates then for us a public realm in which people can interconnect. Um, and I suppose what I'm trying to argue is that there is a continued significance to that connectedness in the digital age. And I'm arguing really in a sense for a material understanding of connectedness. So what I'm going to talk to you about is connectedness or connectivity, not in terms of the digital sphere, which is where you guys all uh, work and excel, but in real, grounded, rooted, co-present kind of co connectivity, which has been central to the work that I've been doing over the last, I don't even want to say it, three decades as a sociologist. So I'm not going to talk about the Internet of Things, I'm going to talk about the sociology of things. And if I have time, I'll try and move on and talk a little bit about disconnect, because there is another side to this whole connection narrative. Uh, but we might leave that aside and do questions if we've run out of time. OK, so prop number one. A little drum roll, please. <laughs> OK, this is prop number one. So. Uh, you can have a look at that. Tell me what I've just thrown at you. The smell is, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, the smell is not unintentional. Uh, it's efficient. Right. Okay. Okay, don't throw it back. <laughs> Super. Okay, so it's a cushion. It's in a sort of a tweedy fabric and there's some buttons on it, right? Oh, sorry. Apologies. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you a little backstory to this cushion. The farmer, a large farmer, living in the southeast of Ireland, married and produced eight children, seven girls and one boy. In due course, the farm and the farmhouse, all of the wealth, if you like, created by that farmer, was willed to the only son. And the seven daughters got their weddings, which is kind of, an, I'm not talking in the 19th century, I'm talking the late 20th century. So the seven daughters were given their marriage. It was, a, in effect, a dowry which their father settled on them. Uh, the man, this farmer was widowed quite early in life, and then he was predeceased by his son. So in fact, his farm ended up going out of the family. And when he died, he really left no belongings except the clothes that he uh, uh, retained. Now his, da his seven daughters had throughout their lives, and particularly in his later life, taken care of him, uh, cooked for him, cleaned for him, uh, taken him out and so on. So after his death, one of the sisters discovered his old suit in the wardrobe. And she took it and she made seven cushions out of her dad's old suit. And you can see some of the buttons and everything featured on it. Okay. So, so what am I trying to say here? Well, I think it tells us a story about the Irish family. And it is about, you know, connectedness uh, between members. But before we think about that, let's think about the other things it tells us. First of all, 
it shows us how patriarchal Irish families traditionally have been. The incredibly rigid gender roles and gender norms that underpinned the way in which that family actually functioned. Now, today we're moving towards more egalitarian family forms, but that notion that there is a patriarch and that they dictate who and how the wealth that the family has been created is dispersed is still very significant. And that is often talked about as a patrilineal uh, line of descent, that anything that is useful or valuable must go down through the male line. And particularly in Ireland, we have a history of strong property rights and a form of inheritance which focused very much on a son, a single son really disinheriting the rest of the family and that relates right back to the famine. So what we see there is how kind of history imprints itself on the social practice of the modern day. But obviously also this man was a pater familias. He was the head of the family, he was loved and respected and remembered after he is gone. And that brings me to his death. I mean death in Ireland is a particular kind of way of recreating connections. Death in Ireland is very ritualistic, uh, particularly if you're a member of the Catholic Church. There are a whole series of rituals that you go through when somebody dies, uh, from removal to mass to month's mind to annual graveyard uh, masses to creating memorial cards and so on. And there are the ways really that we try to keep that deceased person somehow alive, somehow connected to uh, the continuing reality. And I just like this because I think the cushion represents an innovative way of maintaining some sense of connectedness, of belonging to someone who is deceased and keeping the memory alive in a kind of really practical material culture way. It's not a nap. It's a cushion. But every time somebody sits on that cushion or farts on that cushion, they might think about the dad or the grandfather who once actually inhabited the suit. Okay, are you ready for the next prop? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to throw this one out in case somebody doesn't throw it back to me. Okay, so my second prop is a packet of Tato crisps. Tato crisps are the number one crisp in the Irish market and they are beloved of Irish people worldwide. Mr. Tato, as we can see, is about as far removed from Kim Kardashian, Kardashian as you can imagine, but he holds a very dear place in Irish hearts. And what's interesting about Tato is that as a brand it doesn't travel. It has never been able to make it into any other market except amongst the Irish. Now, back in the 1980s, I undertook a PhD in sociology uh, in New York City, and I hadn't chosen a topic for my thesis, but uh, while I was there, I was working one summer in a restaurant downtown, and I just became aware of this large number of Irish people who were, you know, running around waitering and waitressing in these restaurants, and I became one of them. And I discovered that they were all then going back home in the evenings to little ethnic enclaves in Queens and in the Bronx. And these now were a group of people who were undocumented. They were there without papers, without social security cards, working, if you like, in the informal economy. But of course, and, and so it presented itself to me as a topic to investigate. So I ended up doing my doctorate on the undocumented Irish in New York. And of course, one of the things that happens if you're a non-documented immigrant in particular is that you are really very much confined to an ethnic enclave. Your connections cannot be really outside of that because you have this sort of legal status issue that acts as a barrier uh, against any kind of uh, interaction. So with uh, the Irish in New York in the 1980s, they were intensely ethnicized, if you like. They were really dependent on power brokers in the Irish American community to give them jobs. They were dependent on landlords who were willing to accept cash in hand. And of course, they all congregated together in the pubs in the Bronx and in Queens. And what did they do? They swilled lots of beer and they consumed boxfuls of Tato. And the Tato had to be imported from Ireland as did, uh, and this now is going back in the 80s, it's very much pre-internet, Gaelic games, 
major effort to get them onto television screens that could be shown in pubs so that people could connect in with them. Uh, people used to telephone home, like from a dial-up phone, to put money on horse races back in Ireland and then phone a few hours later to see if their horse came in. So the point really is that even though those uh, undocumented Irish in the 80s, they were you know, thousands of miles from home, not really able to integrate in mainstream American culture, at least there were some constraints on that. They nevertheless uh, maintained a very strong high identification with their sense of Irishness, but also with their sense of home. And that, I think, can happen in multiple ways. I mean, nowadays we talk about you know, Skype and Facebook and all of these things connect people across space and across time. But I think Tato crisps have a role to play here as well, because they are something from home. They're quintessentially Irish. They've got this absolutely horrific brand, uh, Mr. Tato, who somehow, you know, has managed to survive in a world of sort of aesthetic perfection. Uh, and uh, it, it links us back, right? It links us back and it is easily transportable and provides a particular kind of sensory experience. I'm sure most of you in this room have, you know, that lovely pleasure of opening a bag of crisps and getting your first munch of it. And I think that that, you know, really represents a symbolic linking uh, back to home, but it also, I mentioned earlier, you know, the imprint of history, it does imp relate back to the potato. Potato in Irish culture, going right back to the famine, that there's something about spuds that Irish people love. We just can't go for more than you know, three or four days without having a spud. And Tato crisps are quite a good substitute. So, uh, in fact, I was at my uh, brother-in-law's 50th birthday party in uh, Alexandria, Virginia last weekend, and one of the things that was brought over, apart from the Barry's tea, was a large box of Tato crisps. So it's not just technology that links people across space and time, I think it's also uh, sensory experiences, material uh, artifacts, if you like, that uh, you know can create that same kind of connectedness. Okay, how am I doing for time? Yeah, not too bad. Okay, so prop number three. Da 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 da. <laughs> oh, I can see you're all just getting carried away with this. Okay, exhibit three. Everybody recognise what we've got here? Yeah. Football jersey, right? Dublin, the best team at the moment. <laughs> the winners, okay, so we'll put our football jersey up there. Okay, so sport. All forms of sport really develop a following that is predicated on identification, connection to something or someone. So it can be a connection to an individual like the way in which a lot of Irish people like Conor McGregor, or it can be a connection to a team, like the Dublin footballers, or the Kilkenny hurlers, or the New England Patriots, or whatever the case may be. There goes our uh, construction outside. Okay, um, and what I would argue, and what sociologists would argue, is that people turn to sport, and, all, and other experiences, like music, for an experience of what Emile Durkheim, back in the 19th century, called collective effervescence. I think it's a fabulous term. Durkheim was writing about religion. He was trying to understand why people had created religion. He, or, you know, why people created a god and focus on that. And Durkheim argued that what we do really in creating religion is that we want to celebrate society, i.e. the social connection between each other. But it's difficult to do that in sort of the everyday, you know, where profane sort of lived lives. So what people did was to create a kind of godlike figure and to sort of transfer onto the god figure that sense of identity of connectedness. So in other words, that God is simply reflecting back to us ourselves, so, uh, uh, society. Now, religion, I mean, obviously, you know, that's a huge area to get into. Some parts of the world, religion, religious experience, religious effervescence has intensified, but in the Western world it has really been declining. And what sociologists have noticed is that things like sport and music in a way have become a kind of replacement or substitute for religion. 
So if we think about that, if we think about you know, people heading off to the All-Ireland final, Dublin and Mayo, you can actually see the same sort of processes going on that would have traditionally gone on around a religious event or a religious kind of experience. So usually there's a kind of a build up, right? People are getting ready. I remember when I was a kid for mass on Sunday, my dad would just take out six children, Catholic family, take out all the shoes and polish them all on a Saturday night for us to go to mass on Sunday. That was a build up. It was saying something special is going to happen. Same, you know, people here will start, you know, listening to commentary, checking stuff out, making sure they have the latest up to date version of their jersey and so on. Sports events like religious events are also really rely on group interaction, on people coming together and focusing on kind of sacred symbols. So in the church it's all about the altar, what the priest is doing and so on. On the field it's about the chants, waving the scarves at the right time, singing, screaming profanities at the ref when they are required. So all of that in a way is about strengthening shared beliefs, values, aspirations and emotions. So, you know, whether you're doing it at Mass on Sunday, whether you're in Crow Park, whether you're down at Electric Picnic, you're engaging in a process of experiencing what Durkheim called collective effervescence. And I think that is a really important way in which we sort of materially and physically connect with others. So putting on that jersey immediately puts you into a place where you're playing a particular role, you're making a statement about a particular set of values and belongings that you embody. So that's really, if you like, the symbolic value of sport, but there's also a very powerful instrumental uh, or functional value to sport. Um, particularly in, and I'm, I'm speaking really from the Irish context here and from research that I have done, but particularly in terms of inculcating a sense of belonging in communities. Now, a few years ago, um, I got to debate with Robert Putnam, the very famous uh, Harvard socio political scientist, who wrote a book called Bowling Al Alone. And it was about the decline of community in America. And he used that metaphor that nobody went bowling in groups anymore in America, and that this was really, if you like, eating into the body politic. And I remember when I was debating with him, I had one great argument as my retort, the Gaelic Athletic Association, the GAA which was founded in Ireland in the 1880s as part of Ireland's attempt to self-determine as a separate country with separate kind of value system, culture, practices, etc. to Britain. The GAA is a nationally organised voluntary organisation. Voluntary, so people are not paid. And it is, operates in the 32 counties of the Republic of Ireland. It operates down at every tiny locality throughout Ireland. Um, a few years ago, myself and some colleagues did a... Now, we know that it's very powerful in rural Ireland, and apart from Dublin, you know, mainly it, it has been uh, rural teams that have really been uh, uh, the top performers, if you like, historically. But Dublin has grown, and Dublin, I think anyone here who's a betting person, will surely think that Dublin are going to absolutely destroy Mayo. I'm sorry for Mayo, the underdog, but I think Dublin are going to win. But how is it so strong in Dublin? Dublin's a met metropolitan area. Well, we did some research on new suburban communities in and around the hinterland of Dublin. And you know, one of the things that we were trying to do was to investigate, are the suburbs, the new suburban areas of Dublin, the areas that have grown 5, 10, 15 miles from the city centre, are they really the social deserts that we hear about? Because suburbs get a terrible press. You know, they get a terrible press in the movies, in literature, uh, where they're always seen as the places that, you know, suck you dry and destroy your soul and turn you into a, you know, a, a broken down alcoholic or a manic sort of Annette Benning in American beauty. So uh, the, the suburb then, you know, we, so we were saying, and, and particularly the Irish Times had, had taken an absolute dislike to them, that everyone should be living in high rise in the city centre, anyone who's in the burbs, social death. So we went and we investigated four of these suburbs and we found actually they're not. They're places that people really like to live and that most people choose to live in. And we found really there are very strong levels of identification with place. And that identification with place was connected to a village being there, a little bit of history, a bit of tradition, a, a bit of heritage. Something like that made a big difference to people because it gave them a sense 
of connection to the place. It was a place that you could call. For example, in Ratoat in County Meath, people were very aware that you know, there was a history of horse racing in the area and that it was a very pastoral environment. And that was really important to their self-identification as suburbanites. We also found that people had a lot of social supports in terms of five or six people that they could call upon um, you know, to mind a child, to borrow a little bit of money, uh, to share a problem with on an ongoing basis, which is actually internationally quite high, having five to six people in your close network. And the third thing was we found a lot of social participation, but the main factor of social participation was the GAA. So people of all ages were involved. It was a kind of a hub that got children, uh, you know, because it sort of really uh, mentors children from a young age, it brings those parents into these circuits of sociability that then operate. And of course, that doesn't just operate in suburban Dublin, it operates in the Irish diaspora beyond Ireland, where we have GAA clubs in places like Dubai. Right? So it's actually creating a, a kind of a social capital that forms a social glue for people, that keeps a community connected. And I think what's particularly interesting about the GAA is that it's actually cross-generational. So you can get involved in it as a five-year-old, 10, 15, 20. You can stay as a mentor, as a trainer. You can actually join your local GAA mem uh, club as an aging person like myself, the over 55s, and you can get cheaper drink in the club. It, and that, you know, that in itself was a bonus. We found very high membership rates in Leakslip County Kildare, mainly because of the cheaper drink in the bar. But the point um, really is a little bit more serious than that, that you know, there are certain kinds of social processes, and I think the GAA is very particular to Ireland, that can create and foster uh, this sort of connection. OK, so uh, fourth. <laughs> Like, I'm an academic, so I'm really supposed to have something to do with books. So I brought a book. I'll just pass around. Copy, you can just pass it around. So <clears throat> this is a little project I want to tell you about. Because again, I think it's an example of material culture, being able to express something, to give a message, to give voice to an experience that otherwise isn't often heard. So there's this wonderful artist called Mary Burke who uh, is Dublin based but she's spent all her life painting suburban portraits, mainly suburban portraits in middle class uh, county Dublin. So she got involved in West Halla. West Halla is one of the most disadvantages, uh, disadvantages areas in Ireland. Uh, when you talk to the people there as I did, they say that they, you know, they often use terms like it's like Beirut, it's uh, Apache land up here. So they, they really have internalized the sense that they're off the edge, that they're a kind of a, a war zone, if you like, uh, beyond the norm. Now, what we did was Mary Burke, the artist, Tala Community Arts and myself got together. And 10 families were selected to have a portrait painted of their house. Now, these are mostly social housing units. So they're not salubrious South County Dublin dwellings. They're pretty ordinary social housing. So uh, what Mary did was to photograph each house and then to paint an individual portrait of each one. And then I interviewed all of the families involved, mainly really to find out from them, you know, their understanding of home, you know, what the house meant to them and so on. And I suppose, and then what we did was to produce it uh, as a book, which shows the process of the portraits being painted, and then has an essay by myself, which you know tries to interpret what home means to these kind of people, to, to the, the people who are involved. Now, I think what's interesting about this is that when we talk about disadvantaged people, people in Tala West, they're often focused on from a deficit model. You know, they're people that need things. They're people that have problems. They're people that, you know, can't manage their lives. They're dysfunctional, they're chaotic, etc. But by doing this project, we were able to provide a much more positive resource model of the people. Because what we did was really to focus on their energy, their imagination, in how they dwell, how they live within their homes. And what we found is that, much like everybody else, home means certain things to people in Tallow West. They love it as a physical structure. They talked about the sturdiness of the house. 
They loved it as a territory, a place where they could set markers. And that's really important in a place like Tala West, where you don't have control over the external environment, where there might be a bit of antisocial behaviour going on outside your front door. So it becomes really important to know that you can close the door on that, that you can draw your net curtains. And you'll see if you flick through the book that everybody has net curtains. So they can look out, but people can't uh, look in. Um, home is a place of self-expression and identity, right? Of course, the difference is that for people in Tala West, a lot of the time they're dreaming. So I interview them, so I'd love to do this. I'm going to try and paint this. At some point, I would like to do. You know, if you're middle class, if you have resources, you can actually make the changes. But they want to change. They want to inscribe their own kind of a, a identity on it. Uh, but it often remains kind of aspirational. And of course, a lot of the decor in these homes are family portraits, family portraits all over the walls, another way of connecting in with family. And homes also operated for them as a social and cultural unit. If you have a home, your family can come in and out of it. And I'm really stressing this because we're living in a moment in Ireland where there's a massive problem with homelessness. And when you think about how the so-called disadvantage in this uh, book talk about how significant home is, it actually makes it all the more stark what people who are homeless are missing. So having a home means that you know, people come in and out, your, you know, your, your, your parents come by, your father comes down to do the garden, your children are in and out, and pets. That was the biggest revelation for me was the amount of people who absolutely adore having dogs, cats, uh, lizards, uh, goldfish, etc., in their home, and that those pets themselves take on a personality of their own. OK, so why am I stressing this? Because I think in the production of these set of portraits, by the way, the portraits were exhibited in Tala and in a few more places around Dublin. But amazingly, each portrait was then presented to the family uh, whose home had been painted, which is a total inversion of the normal situation where uh, you know, art that, go, that is publicly on display usually goes into private collections. In this case, the art that was produced, if you like, went back to uh, the people uh, who, uh, whose, whose homes had been uh, painted. And it, did, it wasn't, if you like, commercialised in the normal way. In fact, it was just a, a temporary public good. People could see it, but it wasn't something that was out there in the public domain. So, uh, I think what is most significant about the book is that it tries to reframe our understandings of how people live in places that are a little bit off the grid, off the beaten track, and it challenges some of the stereotypes and some of the assumptions that we make about people who live there. Okay, so moving on. Fifth and final prop, if it hasn't become, yeah, is my basil plant, okay? <laughs> It's a nice little bit of greenery. Actually, this is becoming quite a nice little tableau here. So, okay, when is a plant not just a plant? Well, when it becomes a basis for social belonging and when it starts to produce social and civic dividends for the community. So, one of the things I've been doing over the last few years is working with a group of Europeans across 20 countries uh, 23 countries in Europe, looking at urban agriculture. Because what we've noted is that particularly since the downturn, the crisis of 2008, there's been a massive resurgence in urban agriculture across Europe. And I use that term extremely widely because it can be anything from growing fruit and veg in a window box to actually setting up an urban farm, a proper sort of commercialised urban farm where you're trying to produce and uh, supply a local market. So, in a way, if you like, one of the unintended consequences of austerity was a new interest or a renewal of interest, I should say, in issues to do with food, food provenance, food security, self-efficacy, being capable or able or knowing where something grows, how it grows and how to harvest and tend it. Uh, and food justice, the idea that all of us really ought to be able to access good quality, high quality food uh, that is locally available. So, uh, as I said, with the European project, we looked at examples right across uh, 
uh, Europe and we looked at different levels of urban agriculture. And what really we found right across the way is that these are fantastic facilities based in cities in and around the peri-urban area that are accessible to people and again it's regardless of age that can be used by unemployed people by homeless people by people with special needs people with disabilities and that there is huge kind of social benefits to getting your hands dirty with soil, cultivating, and seeing if you like the fruit of your labor. So it probably is the opposite of digital production in that you know you actually get a sort of a product after starting with a seed and you're doing lots of things to it, right, in, in the process. Now, I was particularly interested in this because we did a little bit of research which looked at urban allotments in Dublin and also in Belfast. And as you know, Belfast is a very, very segregated city. So anyone who's been to Belfast will know that, you know, territorially it is very divided along sort of ethno-national lines. So you know when you're entering a nationalist area because there'll be murals, the sidewalks will be painted green, white and orange or red, white and blue. So there's constant signifiers in the public space of the city telling you this is Catholic and this is Protestant. And of course, in the era of the peace process, lots of attempts are being made to bring the two communities together, right? And lots of resources have gone into that. Well, what we found was that, and, and it's a slightly overlooked space, that if we, if we look at the kind of politics of place around urban agriculture in Belfast, you find something very interesting, that it is that the agricultural plots that people utilize are actually uh, a place where ethno-religious differences are parked at the gate. So the whole focus of coming into an allotment site and taking out your tools and doing your bit of gardening and opening your flask, having your cup of tea, is all about cultivation. People don't talk about politics. They don't ask each other about their background. It's a public space where there is a single focus and you do not have to become intimate with others or know anything. So we found that a lot of the time people only know people by their first name. But politics was parked uh, at the gate. And we found that particularly interesting that something as sort of, you know, basic as just growing vegetables could, if you like, have a role in creating a more equitable version of the contemporary city, particularly when we think about a city where there are serious problems. OK, so I've just a few more minutes left, so I'll just try and pull some of that uh, together a little more. So when I was thinking about this talk and about focusing on connections and connectedness, I also started to think, OK, I can talk a little bit about some research I've done. I can show how we are connected. But there is also a flip side to that, which is disconnection and disconnectedness. And one of the things that I think has sort of gone through each of these five examples uh, which is somewhat serendipitous because I kind of just pulled them together rather eclectically, is the whole issue of social class. And social class is interesting because social class does reinforce connection within class, but it also creates division between classes. And I mean, that's not a new insight. That's exactly what Marx was saying in the 19th century and what Max Weber also said. And I, indeed, Marx and Weber both argued that, you know, social class is based around one group having something, one not having it. Weber was a little bit more, he talked about things like status and access to power as well. But more recently, uh, British sociologist Mike Savage did this really cool thing at the great BBC class survey. It was a piece of academic research, but it was also done through a kind of a, um, an outreach through the BBC to the British public, where they tried to kind of unpick a little bit what does class mean in the contemporary world. And he borrows from Pierre Bourdieu, the French sociologist, to argue that when we think about class now, we have to think about it as economic capital, which means money and wealth and land. We have to think about it as cultural capital, which means being able to appreciate and engage with cultural goods, like being able to you know, go to festivals, listen to music, uh, appreciate art, play sport, uh, use the gym and so on. And also having educational credentials, which of course you all have tons of. So cultural capital is really important. Probably, I think increasingly the most important capital. And thirdly, there's the social capital, which is our contacts and connectedness that allow people to 
create a social network around themselves, which they can then draw upon. OK, so just thinking back then on what I've been saying and using my props from the perspective of a social class. In Ireland, land has always been and continues to be a hugely powerful resource in our society. So Marx and Weber both talked about the property class and the property less class. And amazingly, that is the world that we live in today. We live in a world where people either are homed or have homes or access to homes or people are homeless. And that sort of really strong commitment to property and the right to property is strongly enshrined in our constitution. It cannot be removed. And interestingly, Iceland underwent a sort of a, a crowd uh, funded uh, constitutional review a couple of years ago where you know it sort of was a crowd based uh, attempt to rewrite the Icelandic constitution they couldn't get any change on the right to property in that constitution so in Ireland I think that has been a huge obstacle to creating a basis for greater cohesion in our society so if we go back to our farmer seven daughters one son but that precious boy must get that farm so as not to lose that family resource, that it must be retained. So that sort of notion of land and property and how you hang on to what you have is really uh, significant. Um, I spoke about uh, the uh, Tato, you know, as the Tato loving Irish immigrants, but that didn't really encompass all of the immigrants because we can't assume homogeneity amongst immigrants living in any society. There are very clear class differentials in terms of people's access to economic, cultural and social capital. So when I did it, because I did a lot of research on the Irish abroad and then I did research on returners, people who came back. And I came up with a kind of a, a um, typology. I don't actually, have, I, I only made 15 copies. I was very pessimistic about how many people would show up. <laughs> So uh, you, you can just have a look at it or pass it on to somebody else. Um, so what I was trying to do there was to kind of show that if you're thinking about a migrant, and some of you I'm sure are immigrants in this room, you know, you can actually think about where do I fit on a migration typology? So this is a typology I generated to try and capture that notion that when we're in the world, you know, we all have access to these different kind of resources. So. I've described three different types of emigrant, and this is all based on research on Irish people, but I think some of it is actually would work for Polish and Lithuanian uh, and Romanian as well. So the reserve army emigrants are the ones that Marx talked about, the people who basically are uh, the sans culotte, the people who have little skill, little opportunity, and will go anywhere for work. The global adventurers are the kind of you know, flexible, mobile, contingent people, gap years, you know, two-year visa in Canada, want to spend a bit of time out of my home country. And the cosmopolites are the elite, the international, circulating, transnational people who go where people, you know, beg them to go, who are sort of, you know, at the very, very top of their profession and essentially spend 50% of their lives on a jet flying around the world. So then what I'm suggesting is that we can understand their experiences in terms of the different opportunity structures they face, dis different decision makings they are able to make, their primary goals, which are all different, their persona. So, you know, my argument is that the Irish I met in New York were the undocumented. They didn't have many rights legally that forced them into a strong kind of ethnic orientation. And so they end up being Tato crisp eaters. Whereas, you know, people who go to work in one of the big four financial firms in New York are going to be sipping Manhattans in Manhattan. They're not going to be out in Queens eating Tato. Um, and you can see at the end, I just said, you know, the overall status position for reserve army people, it's precarious. And there's a lot of research in sociology now going on about the precarious workplace, which is actually growing. Uh, the global adventurers are the hipsters, and maybe there's a lot of hipsters in this room. The cosmopolites are the citizen-like people. These are the people that won't be impacted by Brexit, that are just above all of that, that just you know, um, are extremely well secured in their position. OK, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to finish up in just a second. OK, so that, I wanted to make that point about class and the migration issue. 
I talked about the suburbs as great places to live and you know people really sort of connecting with each other through things like the GAA but I also would like you to remember that Dublin is one of the most spatially and socially segregated cities in Europe. We don't mix our social classes and we don't mix our housing types in Ireland. Private home ownership is glorified. Anybody else you know, who doesn't own their own home is somehow a failure, hasn't gone on the property ladder, didn't do it right. People in Ireland do live in either affluence or in poverty and Tala West is one example of that. Even with sport, I emphasise the whole GAA thing, the community thing, but we know that sport itself is class stratified and that certain sports, rugby, are associated with a particular form of social class reproduction through private school education, through having the right kind of social networks and so on. Whereas other sports like boxing and martial arts, like Conor McGregor, traditionally are really based in a working class male culture. The last example I talked about were the allotments uh, and the urban agriculture and to me they do have some potential around this social integration. Because on allotments, as I already mentioned in relation to Northern Ireland, people meet as strangers and they can remain so. There's no obligation to get to know people, to hang out with them, to have anything to do with them beyond the on-site cultivation or activity. So they fulfil a very important role associated with urban public life, with Richard, Richard Sennett has written really eloquently about. That we all need spaces that are relatively open to all, no cost of entry, uh, where people can congregate, communicate, encounter each other in fleeting exchanges, and where there's just a level of confidence and trust that makes it work, but doesn't mean that we ever have to become anything but sort of passing strangers to each other. And those spaces are important because they do generate a sense of subjective competence, but also a sense of collective belonging, that, you know, we are connected to others. Uh, so I think they form part of a public realm which offers the potential for intersection points between different class groupings. Um, and there, you know, I've used allotments as an example of that, and, and the allotments that we've looked at in Dublin definitely uh, have lots of evidence. One of the things that people described the allotments as as social levelers. Everybody's got their boots on, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, we're all doing the same thing. Uh, if you go to cycle one of the fabulous greenways around Ireland now in Waterford or Westport, again, there are spaces of social intersection, all kinds of people on them, all kinds of bicycling, all kinds of levels of fitness, uh, and they all mix together. If you go for a swim in the 40 foot, which I do frequently, or in Sea Point, you will meet all of human life there, I guarantee you. So I'm really, my final point is to make an argument that we believe in connection, that we believe in connection is something which is about co-presence, and that, you know, these kind of public realm spaces that are open, that are social levelling spaces, are very distinct from privatised policed spaces. Spaces like shopping malls, like gated communities, or even social media to some extent, which is highly individualised and where everyone is heavily surveilled. So I'm arguing for a, a, the promotion, creation and inhabiting the public realm uh, so that, because I think that is a way of pushing back against the forces that would divide us, and we know what they, where those forces are, and the forces that would demonise the other in society. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>